It is good to see you. We welcome you. If you're first time guests, we're excited you're with us here at Believers Church. Love to have a record of your being here. On the seat in front of you, you'll find a card, or you can go to bcnow.church. Let us know you're here, and we have a gift for you on your way out if you want to stop. Uh, at the next step table there, we have something we'd like to give you, but we are glad that you are with us today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts. You can also follow along at uh, bcnow.church if you'd like to. You know, there's been, um, I think at least twice, these are big moments in, in our lives, that uh, Karen and I have had actually someone gift us, give us a vehicle. And um, I, I remember the first time we were, we decided that, yeah, we're going to say yes to what God wants. We're going to follow him. We're going to go do this mission work out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we sold everything. Many of you have heard this story. And, and um, a family in our church family there knew what we were doing, knew this is God's plan for us. And the gentleman called me one day and said, can you come by the house? And, or I mean the office, actually. He had a cellular uh, business. And so uh, Ken and I went by there one afternoon and he came walking out of the back and he had the title to a minivan and he just handed it to us and he said, God, just put this on our hearts to, to give it to you. And that, that's happened twice to us. And, and it happens all the time, literally, uh, it, within church families. You know, last weekend uh, we went out to eat with some, some folks in the church and, and they were insistent pretty much on uh, paying for carrying our meal. And beyond that, they came home and there was a need that if I would have tried to do it, I would have made a mess uh, of it. But um, this gentleman, because he's so good at it, was able to do it in like 15 minutes. And this is what the church does. And this is church family. And I'm telling you, I could tell stories. And all of you all have stories of ways that others have come together, whether it's provide a meal or, or whatever that may be for, for someone who is in, in need. And when the church loves like Jesus, the church, listen, it's unstoppable. The church is unstoppable when we are family. And what I love about this, this new series that we're beginning today, you know, love in, in the church, is, is that I, I've loved the church ever since I was a little kid. I, I really have. Uh, maybe not for the right reasons. Um, some of you like me may have loved church for the Cheerios that you would get, you know, during the, during the service, um, or some of you older kids, maybe for the goldfish that, um, that, that you're able to get. And, and, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a dynamic children's ministry like we have here at Believer's Church. Elementary, you, you went to church with, with the adults in the service, and it seemed like, you know, at that age, that the pastor just went on forever. Uh, you know, it, when's he ever going to land this thing so we can go to eat? Uh, but my dad, um, he, he always wore a suit. And um, he always carried this hard candy in his left pocket of that, of that suit. And he would, during, during the service, a lot of times, if, we start, if you start to get a little fidgety, he would reach in there and he would pull out, a peppermint and a butterscotch or something. And he had huge hands, man. And he would let, like lay that over in front of you. And for me, it was like, Mike, I want you, I knew what he meant. Show me which one you want. Because I wasn't allowed to open it during church because it made all this noise. You ever tried to open one of those during church? <laughs> you know. So I'd, I'd point it to like the butterscotch and he'd put it back in his pocket. And he'd just start unwrapping that thing, you know. In his pocket, and the big old hands in that little pocket, trying to, trying to get that under. And eventually, he would get that unwrapped for me. But when I was just this little guy, it just seemed like it took him forever. Is there anybody here that you just really enjoy waiting? Let's see your hands. None of us enjoy waiting, do we? But it's so much as part of the Christian life. Yeah, I, I don't like to wait. As a matter of fact, Jesus asked the disciples to wait. How many of you remember this? Just before he ascended to heaven, he said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem, men, and I want you to wait. They're like, okay, wait for what? What do you want us to wait for? He's like, I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit. I want you to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And in Acts 1.8, we read, and Jesus is speaking to the, to the disciples here, and he tells them, you know, wait for the Holy Spirit. And it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses 
to Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus is telling them. Put yourself in their shoes and they've got to be going, really? Okay, I, we've been listening to you teach this. I heard about the little kid who was supposed to memorize this verse and he came home and uh, his mom said, honey, have, have you been memorizing? He said, yeah. He said, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem in Jamaica and all the Caribbean islands. And I'm, thinking, I'm in for that one, you know. How many want to do a mission trip to Jamaica? Yeah, let's do that, right? So Jesus was telling them that they were going to be his church, his witnesses. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the church and the power of God came on the church to be his witnesses. And listen, this is where the church began. Okay, this is, this is where the church began. And we also know from reading this that Peter stepped up on, on, on that first day and he preached to this large crowd. And we read about it in Acts 2, 41. If you want to go over to Acts chapter 2 now, verse 41, it says, So those who received his word were baptized as a result of the preaching of the gospel. And, and there were added to the, that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people. So the very first day that the church began... It goes from a small group of people to over 3,000 people. From Jesus and his disciples, from that day to today, over, what, I don't know, a few billion people now are followers of Christ, or have become followers of Christ as a result of this. The church began, and the church is the family of God. And what happened in the church was this, that God started a new family. Because I, I want to start this new family. Look at verse 42 of chapter 2. Themselves ...to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Listen, I gotta tell you something. I love that passage. Some of you are going, duh. You know, it's the church. It's what you do. But I remember reading that passage in college and thinking... This is, this is what I want to be a part of. This is what I want to give my life to. And I, I sensed in that season of my journey, God was calling me to be a pastor, to work in ministry. I told, as a matter of fact, I told an older pastor, I said, this is what I, I'm, I'm sensing God wants me to do, to go and, and be a pastor. And he was like, Mike, if you can do anything but be a pastor, go do that. So I tried. And I went to Eastman and... I, honestly, I know many of you work at Eastman, have worked at Eastman. But for me, because God had called me down a different path, it felt like I was in prison. I mean, if you're out of God's will or not where God wants you to be, sometimes you have to walk in those seasons before you realize where you need to be, right? So he allowed me to walk through that to see that that's not what his plan was for me. I'm not saying you can't be a disciple of Christ. You can have a great ministry and work at the Eastman. Many of you have. Yeah, I remember telling my dad, because dad, he, you know, he was a big Eastman guy. You know, dad, I don't think I can, I can do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my family. We're moving to Ohio. They've called. They said they have a need for me to be a student pastor, education pastor, uh, music minister, because we're going to fire the music ministry, and then eventually preach, because we're going to fire the, pretty much fire the preacher. Anyway, long story. But my dad struggled. He, he, he struggled with that. But I remember, you know, the day we pulled out, we all loaded up in the minivan, and um, I'd had my window rolled down. We were sitting on the carport, and Dad walked over, and he said, you're doing the right thing. You're doing what, what God wants you to do. And, and that, from that day, you know, I, I began to devote myself to serve in the local church, and it's been just an incredible journey. And I want to tell you something. Believer's Church, there's no other place on the planet that I'd rather be than right here, teaching God's Word and serving with you. There's no other place that, that I'd rather be. And, and you know... To me, seeing life change at the places where God's had us serve, and, and especially here now, has just been amazing. And I want you to know it's a privilege 
to be your pastor day after day after day. I get to see the church impact lives. I get to see God's Word literally impact lives. Even this Friday, working, working up at the day center and seeing how God is impacting lives. And, it, you know, I asked Mom, and I'd heard her say this before, but I wanted to make sure. I said, Mom, how long have you known that I was going to be in ministry or be your pastor? And she said, well, I knew it when you were just a baby. But I didn't say anything because I really didn't want to influence what God wanted to do. And, I, I, and Karen and I, I mean, we love the church. You say we were talking a lot about family for a reason. Because that's what we're going to talk about today. And, you know, for me, my family, they're, they're a part of this, this fellowship. And I think it's really cool. Honestly, I, I don't know how they could listen to me week after week. <laughs> but they, they can come in here and continue to, to do that. Hey, you know what? I showed you a clip here a while back uh, from a Christmas experience. You know, every Christmas our whole family gets together and we have this big spread of food and fun and this, this, this great time. It, it's all great. But the best part of that, you know what it is? It's, it's being together as a family. To me, that's the best part. I mean, take the food away. Some of us would probably complain, especially Chick-fil-A chicken nuggets, you know. We wouldn't like that very well. Gifts, eh, I think we'd be all right. We're a blessed family. We wouldn't have to have that. I remember one Christmas, mom and dad, through I think my brother's help, because they had this dock at the lake now in this cabin, they bought a jet ski for the kids and grandkids. And it was just amazing they kind of un unveiled that. You know, when, when Dad was still alive and they had this place on the lake, our family would get together and we would come down there. Some Sundays we'd just all be down there hanging out. We'd have special occasions, Fourth of July and other things. We'd have hot dogs, we'd fish and ride on the barges and jet skis, and we just had a blast. And, and you know, you think, I think every father's dreams kind of, God, give me enough land where my whole family can live on it. Grandkids and, and everybody. I just want them all right here, right here with me. And I tell you that not because we're a perfect family, but because I hope it illustrates that family is how God created the church to be. You see, the church is not perfect. Can I get an amen? Something? I mean, the church is chaotic sometimes. And the church is messy sometimes. But we are to be loving people, and we are to be accepting people of others. And the, other, the early church, they understood themselves as a family. A family where they said, you know what, everyone's welcome. That everybody who wants to can come and be a part of this. I don't care if you're married, I don't care if you're single, I don't care if you're divorced, widowed, whether you have children or grandchildren or 18 grandchildren. By the way, in case you missed it, this past week, um, welcome Delaney Grace Clark to our family. And um, we're so, so blessed. And congratulations to Tyler and Megan and Foster. Um, they, are, they, they brought a, a beautiful young lady into, into the world. But here's the thing. You know what? Everybody's welcome in this family. Amen? And we can't forget that. So here's what I want you to do before we jump in here. I want to give you some things. I want you to look at the person beside you. And I want you to tell them, You are my brother from another mother or my sister from another mister. Go. <laughs> okay, so to help us understand this family, I want to talk about three major moments in family throughout history. So if you're taking notes, you go, you'll find them both in the bcnow.church and also on the paper there this week. Three major family moments. Number one is this. God creates family. Family is God's idea. We already kind of alluded to that as we've been opening up here. And it's fascinating when you think about it. This whole idea that, that God had, it, it really fascinates me because you take two adults and they come together and they bring another per person into their home, right? We created, God created by His blessing this, uh, this child. And they don't get paid for it. <laughs> they create this part, they don't get paid for it. In other fact, they paid for it big time, actually, right? As a matter of fact, tell your neighbor what you think the average cost of raising a child is from zero to 18. Go ahead, tell them. What, what do you think it is? All right, you got it? The answer, um, this varies from where, wherever you're, you're at, but it's probably somewhere around 
225,000 to 250,000, not counting college. How many of you were close? Let's see your hands. No, all right, Larry. And here's the thing for parents hey, there's no refunds, all right? You, you don't get any refunds on that. I mean, we pay out big time, sacrifice sleep, sacrifice our calendars. Why? Here's the thing why do we do that? Here's why because the first time you hold that little baby and they smile at you, your heart just goes, and you know, until you find out it was gas, right? <laughs> But there will come a time when those little arms will just uh, wrap around your, your neck. And for the first time, you'll understand why those little hands and why those little arms were made. See, God created family. Family is God's idea so that we'd understand His grace, so that children would know that they're loved and accepted and valued before they ever did anything to even deserve it. So that parents would understand that when you give, you receive and the ones who receive the most give the most. So family is God's idea so that we would understand that one day when he said this, he said, I am your father and you are my son and you are my daughter. That we would begin to grasp it in our hearts and we would open up and receive the love that he has for us. So family is God's idea. That's why he tells us in Ephesians 3, 14, it says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, Paul said, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And what Paul is saying, that God has created family, here's what he's saying, that God has created family to be on display. And what are we going to display? We're supposed to be displaying the very nature of who God is. What is that? That's God's love. That's God's, that's, that's God's character. And that's God's grace. That's who we're supposed to be reflecting as the family of God. That we would just be this reflection of who He is. That we would experience that with our family. And then He goes on, verse 16, and that says, That according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love. I mean, that's what we all dream. That's what we all want. I think that's what we all hope for in, in our own family. You see, family is not just some biological mechanism where DNA is, is passed on from this gene pool. Family is God's idea. And we are to be a reflection of His character and who He is. We are to be this vehicle of grace so that others... In other words, a manifestation of His kingdom, that's God's idea. And that's what He's called us to do. And some of you might be thinking, well, you don't know my family. <laughs> you know, you, you have no idea. You don't know how I grew up. It was, it was rough. Which leads us to the second major moment in family history, and that is this. Sin distorts family. It brings family dysfunction. Sin distorts family. It brings family dysfunction. You see, there are no perfect families. Everybody should have said, come on, preach it. Amen. One author said that the definition of a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one person. And I think that's good. And when you read through the Bible, you see... Uh, it's a story, especially in Genesis. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. When you go back, Genesis, it's a story of families. And there are so many dysfunctional families. Have you ever looked at it this way? I mean, it's, it blows my mind. Just a few. I mean, you'll find Adam and Eve committed the first sin. And they, what did they do? They messed it up for all of us. I mean, if not for them, we'd all be naked right now, right? Cain and Abel have this conflict and jealousy. Kill, one of them kills one another. Lamech, he, he introduces polygamy into the human race. Noah, he gets drunk and curses his son. Abraham lies says to his wife and his sister, then he, you know, and then he, then he plays favorites with his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and then Isaac, and he plays favorites between who Jacob and Esau, and they're bitter for years, and then, then Jacob, who plays favorites between Joseph and, remember this, from a few weeks ago, and his 11 brothers, and they sell him into slavery, and then they try to cover up as, as murder. How many of you feel better about your family now? Well, everybody's hands should go up, come on. But here's the question. Why did the author, why did God include these stories in Genesis? Oh, I think for a couple of reasons, as I was thinking about it this week. The first, that this, he wants us to know that when you sin, it doesn't just affect you. 
When you sin, it doesn't just affect you. I think that's one of the most expensive lies that any person can ever tell themselves. You know, rabbis used to tell a story about two men that were in a boat. They would go out in the middle of the lake, and one of the men would pull out one of these hand drills. And he begins to drill a hole in the bottom of the boat, and the other man looked at him, and he says, Hey, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're drilling a hole in the bottom of the boat. And he says, Well, it's under my seat. One of the most expensive lies we can tell ourselves is that sin will only affect us. Most expensive. But our sins affect all those around us, all of our, our relationship. It affects relationships and families and generations. The second reason that I believe you find those dysfunctional families and stories in Genesis is this, because God wants us to know that no matter how dysfunctional things may get or be, He's going to keep this hope, He's going to keep this dream of redemption alive. And no matter how dysfunctional things are, God is always going to be bringing hope and giving hope and speaking hope. He's going to always be present. He's going to always be working. And one day hope shows up and hope has a name and his name is Jesus who goes to the cross and dies for your sins and for my sins. And Jesus lives and he shows us a better way to live and he loves and he shows us this better way to love and he teaches us that God is starting and going to start this new family um, among us, which leads us to the third major family moment, and it's this. With the church, God creates a new family. With the church, God creates a new family. And he says that anyone can get into this family. Imagine that. Anybody can be a part of the family of God. Uh, if you want to be a part of the family, uh, you know, a couple of ways here, I guess you, you can think about this. The first one is through birth, and the second one through adoption. And the scripture teaches us um, with the family of God. Again, one being born again, the other being adopted as his sons and daughters. Now, you may not know this, maybe you do. In, in New Testament times, under the Roman law, it was actually impossible for you to disown a child that you had adopted. It was impossible. You could not do it. Now, it was possible to disinherit, to disown a child that was biologically born to you. You're thinking, well, that seems backwards, doesn't it? But you could not disown or disinherit a child that had been adopted. And I think what God wants us to know by using this, this, this kind of language is that He chose us. And He wants us. God chose me. Say that with me. God chose me. God wants me. Say that with me. God wants me. And guess what? God will never disown you. He'll never disown you. You're born again as His sons and daughters, adopted into the kingdom of God, and adopted into the family of God. And we're part of this family. We're part of this great family of God. Now, Christianity is oftentimes talked about like it's only uh, a belief. But I believe there's, there's so much more to this in Jesus' teaching we find out through the, the, the early church. is that there, I think there's this belonging system that we see inter, interweave through this. And, and the New Testament church in Acts 2, the, the church understood that they were part of a family. That they viewed themselves as part of this family. And that in, really actually impacted their whole lives. It was a way that they lived. It, it's the family of God. And you got to understand, the world had never seen this kind of family before. This is all new for the very first time. Everybody in the, the rest of the world, outside of the church, they'd never seen this kind of love. They'd never seen this kind of family that had come together. And it was going to transcend beyond gender, beyond economics, background, age, generation, education, skin color, whatever. The world had never seen this. And, and, and when God looks at the church, guess what? He sees this family. And you and I have been invited to be a part of, of this family. And this is the way God envisions the church. Now, I hope to always carry on the family gatherings that I've talked about on Christmas. And if we have a place where we can do this with the grandchildren, I hope to always be able to carry on some of these things. Here's what I found out as, as, as you get a little older, is that, that the, these family values are what drives this kind of thought process because what you find is you're going to have this love you're going to have a generosity you're going to have sacrifice 
You're going to have serving. That's how we got to where we are today from our living room many years ago because there's been people who've been givers, servers, sacrificers so that we could be where we are today. But how many of you think today that God's finished with this church, that this is, this is it? I sure hope not. We're just getting started. And you know, I think in Acts chapter 2, what God does is he, he zooms in on the church and he shows us the snapshot of the church. And, and, and he wants us to look for, you know, from, from the text here and see the values that are driving these kind of behaviors. So that's what I'd like to do for just the rest of the time today. I want to look at five family values that we find in Acts chapter 2. So if you want to follow in the notes, you can. I'll try to move pretty quick. Um, number one is this, five family values. We accept the outsider. We accept the outsider. You see, the early church was an, it was an environment of acceptance. I mean, think about this. One day they went from a handful of people to over 3,000. What would we do if 3,000 people showed up next Sunday? I'm asking you, what would we do? Celebrate. <laughs> Celebrate, there you go. Anybody else, what would we do? Look for a bigger room. What, what else? Pray. God help us. <laughs> Let me tell you something else we would do. We would serve them. We would love them. We would encourage them. We would teach them God's Word. Amen. I mean, we, I'm sure we'd go, who are all these people? <laughs> and where in the world did they come from? That's probably what the early church was saying. This handful, three thousand, where, where did they come from? They went from this environment, check this out, where they knew everyone's name to a place where they hardly knew anyone. It, 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 but they accepted them. They accepted them. And it, it's part of a family. It's who we are together. And the difference between acceptance and rejection, listen, it's huge. Just think back to when you were in high school and you walked into the lunchroom for the very first time. If you went to a large high school, how, did you, how many of you really liked that feeling? Probably none of us, right? Why? Because you're wondering this. Will I be accepted and will there be a place for me to sit? I think sometimes we forget in our family and it's one of the reasons I believe God's put this series on my heart is that when people do come, when they do say, hey, I want to check out what's going on at Believer's Church, that we are ready, that we serve them well when they come through the doors, that we smile at them, that we greet them, that we uh, that tell them who we are, that they know that they are welcome and they can be a part of this family and they will be accepted. I think that's important. I've traveled around the United States and traveled around the world a little bit. All over this world, you will find people, and I've run into them, and I've had conversations with them, and they'll say, they say, well, I know, you know, we'll begin the conversation. I know you're a pastor. Blah, 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 and, eh. But they're like, I don't go to church. And some people use this for excuse. I really believe it. You know, I'm not judging. I just think they do. Because it's obvious they, and their excuse is, well, I just don't have anything nice to wear. Um, but the truth is, in some places, even in places of the world, there are people in these countries and say, well, I don't have anything to wear to church, thinking that they won't be accepted because they don't have anything to wear. Many people may say, we just don't have any shoes. We don't have nice shoes. How many of y'all remember that time uh, we all gave our shoes away? I mean, if you were there, let's see your hands. That was, that was a cool Sunday, wasn't it? I mean, it's just a hundred, actually a couple hundred pairs of shoes probably. Everybody just brought them forward in the, at the end of the service and set them on a park bench. And we took them, we gave them to homeless. And that's what God's calling us to do. He's like, give our shoes away. <laughs> He's saying, give your life away. Don't think about your shoes. 
I'm, I'm calling you to give your life away for the sake of what? For the sake of the kingdom. What's the kingdom? The church. The gospel. Now, sadly, some churches, for whatever reason, have turned. And it's almost like if you don't look like them, smell like them, act like them, talk like them, you can't be a part. God forbid you have a different translation in what they think you should be carrying. I mean, if you don't come in this door with a King James, Ver King James Version, or if you don't teach from a King James Version, I'm not going to listen to you. That's kind of the attitude, and it's so sad, isn't it? How many of you know what translation Jesus used? It wasn't NAS. It wasn't Message. It wasn't the NIV. It wasn't the ESV. How many of you know? Let's see, all you biblical scholars. What translation did Jesus use? I came up with it this week. It's simple. You know what it was? It was L-O-V-E. That was his translation. Love motivated him. Love. And love brings hope and acceptance and forgiveness. Come as you are to Jesus to the cross. But many people are worried that they will not be accepted. For whatever reason it may be. You know, will I be accepted? Will there be a place there? There's this, it's just a question that people ask. And, and I think, church, sometimes we forget when, when new folks come in here and, and they're checking us out or they're going through the motions of part of the ministry. It's, it's in their minds. It's in, would I be accepted here? And they'll know that because of our hearts. One, one theologian defines acceptance as making space for people that we don't have to make space for. Making space for people that we don't have to make space for. And I think that's great. And I know a lot of times when you hear that, your, your, your mind automatically goes to physical space, but that's not all, the, all he was saying here. But that's what we should be doing as a church. That's what the church in Acts chapter 2 did. They made space for people that they didn't have to make space for. They made space in their homes. They made space in their worship. They made space in their conversations. They made space at the table. They made space in their hearts for other people. And that's what we're to do as a church. Make space for people. It's who we're called to be as a church. Sometimes, though, I think we can forget this. We can forget what it was like when we were on the outside. Sometimes we forget what it's like maybe to visit for the very first time. And that's why I think 20 years after the church started, Paul, Paul writes this. He says, I want you to accept one another as Christ accepted you. That's what I want you to do. Why? Because this is going to be praise to God, glory to God. Here's a question for us. How did Christ accept you? How did Christ accept you? Just as you are, right? Just as you are. Here, it, it, I mean, he didn't wait for you to get it all together. But here's the question. Why did he accept you? Why did Christ accept you? Because he made space for you and me at the cross. He made that space. See, it's about making space for others. And we can't forget this. It's, it's, it's at the heart of God. It's a family value as a church. Second family value is this. We are loving one another. We are loving one another. Jesus loved, he loved the disciples like they'd never been loved before. You have to put yourself in their shoes. He loved them unto death by basically laying down his life. But before he went to the cross, he told the disciples, he said this, Hey guys, listen, you've been what you've been You've been walking with me, you've been seeing this. He said, but I want, to give you a, I want to give you this new command. I want to give this to you. And he says, here it is, that you would love one another as I have loved you. You've watched me. You've witnessed this. That's how I want you to love other people. And then he goes on to say, he's like, this is how they'll know that you're, you're my disciples, that you're part of my family, that you love one another. That's how they're going to know this. In other words, I want you to be the most loving group of people in the world. What's one of the challenges for Believer's Church? To be one of, if not the most loving group of people that meets on this side of the county, in the state of Tennessee. How many of you know what the mark of spiritual maturity is? Anybody? I've heard some say, well, it's the amount of devotions that you had this week, or maybe the amount of Bible knowledge you have, or maybe because you went to a 
Christian school, or maybe you went to this college, or it's, maybe it's your education that, that does this. I'm telling you, some of the most mature Christian believers can have some of the hardest hearts when it comes to understanding what it means to love another brother and sister in Christ. Some of the newest believers in Christ can tend to be the most accepting, loving people. Has anybody else experienced this besides me? The mark of spiritual maturity is, you ready? Are you more loving today than you were yesterday? Are you more loving today than you were yesterday? See, God wants us to be the most loving people in the world. And Jesus says, when the world looks in and they see your love, they will know that you are the family of God. And, and when the church loves well, the world, listen, they don't know what to do with us when we love this way. They're like, what, who is that? Who's that group of people? I, I don't get it. So let me get this straight, Mike. You mean a couple of people have given you vehicles in ministry? Yeah. Why? Why do you think they do that? Because, because we're part of the same family when there was a need. You see, when the church is loving, people show up. We don't know. We, we, we invite people. And people make decisions, and they're going to lean their lives against the cross, and they're going to find forgiveness. It's one of the things. How many of you saw something in the Sunday paper this morning? It was a little graphic, and it says, Love August. Did anybody see that? Let's see your hands. I'm just curious if anybody ever looks at it. One, two, three. Love August. I didn't put an explanation to it because I wanted to tell you this morning. I don't know if you remember a while back, I said, hey, uh, most churches take up food around Thanksgiving and Christmas for people in need. And I said, people get hungry in the summer too. Anybody remember that message? And I said, so as a church, what about this? What if we do this? In August, here's what we're going to do. And this is just a part of love that we, one of the ways we can love our community. We're going to call it Love August. We're going to bring non-perishables all through the month of August and we're going to try to fill up that whole counter out there, give them to the Second Harvest Food Bank or wherever we can find the greatest need and, and, and say, there you go. Can we do that, church? Let's love the community in August this way. You know, love, love, it moves hearts to serve food to those in our life groups who may be in need. It moves hearts to show up at a funeral when someone in our life group or our family has, has lost someone close to them. Love moves our hearts when we see a need and we feel it. When we love like Jesus as a church, I'm telling you something, folks, we are unstoppable. We're unstoppable. Jesus said to love one another as I, as I have loved you. And that's, that's his word to the church, and that's his word to believers church. Love one another as I have loved you. I mean, we don't have to be the most successful. We don't have to be the wealthiest. We don't have to be the smartest. We just have to be the most loving. That's our call. Church, be loving. And that's how the world's going to know that we're part of his family. The third family value is this. We are real with one another. We are real with one another. Look at Acts 2.42, really quick. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. You might circle those words, glad and generous. Your text may say sincere for generous. In other words, they were real. They, they weren't pretending. And, and sometimes I think it's so easy for us to pretend. We, we cover up and we say, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's good. When, when it's really not, we, we, make things, we try to make things look better than we really are. Students are really bad at this. It's called impression management. You know what I'm talking about. We're trying to manage how you are impressed by my life. We, we, we all have this tendency that when, when we know other people are watching us that we pretend. But church is a place, listen, where we don't have to pretend. It shouldn't be a place where we have to pretend. But he says that we, they had glad, they had these generous hearts, they had these sincere hearts. And, and the question then, as I'm reading this, is, well, well, do you know why? Do I know why, Mike? Because... When you are a generous person, listen, your heart is glad. When you're a generous person, your heart is glad. I mean, if you know that you can come through these doors and find a sister in Christ or a brother in Christ and share a hurt with them, and they look back across at you 
and say, I feel the pain you're in. I know you're hurting. I'm going to be praying with you. I want you to know I love you. And you're going to get through this. And you don't judge them. You don't put them on a scale of one to ten on how much they know Christ. I mean, when you are real with somebody, listen, I'm telling you, people have been bound by religion. When they finally get to a place where grace and truth come together in this beautiful explosion of the way I believe God and Jesus described it, they, their lives tend to come alive for the first time. They're going, oh, I get it for the first time. We want to be real with one another. Before, real quick, we speak the truth to one another. We speak the truth to one another. You know, we need people around us who will speak the truth in our lives. That's one of the ways that we grow together. We grow together by being around each other. We grow by loving one another. But we also grow by people speaking truth and love, key in love, into our lives. You know, in, in, back in verse 42, it says, and they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You might want to circle that word devoted there. What were the apostles' teaching? What were the apostles teaching here? The apostles were teaching about Jesus. What, what, what Jesus had to say to them all up to this point. So the, the people would gather around and they devoted themselves to what Jesus had said. What did he talk about? He talked about so many things. He talked about the priorities. He talked about possessions. He talked about forgiveness. He talked about finances. He talked about spirituality. He talked about sexuality. He talked about so many different things. That's what they were going through here. And they didn't just hear this information. Check this out. They actually devoted their lives to carrying it out. I mean, they didn't just go one Sunday and huddle up and hold hands and get the play called. They actually left the huddle and they went out and they ran the play. Can you imagine those of you who played football going to the huddle and huddling up? The clock's running. The defense is waiting on you. You're the offense and you're in the huddle. And all of a sudden you're, you're there and you're like, man, it feels so nice in here. No one's trying to hurt me. Nobody's trying to hit me. I just love our huddles, don't you? <laughs> You're looking at the other players, and they're probably going, huh? I don't want to leave. It just feels so secure in, the, in this huddle. Because when we leave, people are going to try to block us and hit us and tackle us, and it hurts. Could you imagine if UT had stayed in the huddle the entire season last year, what their record had been? Okay, bad example. You get the point. Here's the thing. We can't just stay in the huddle. We've got to run to play. That's what God's called us to do. We can't just stay in the huddle. So when we come together and hear the teaching, we run this play together. We speak the truth to one another. What did Jesus say and how can we get our lives around it? Which leads us to the very last family of is this. Number five, we continue to have a mission beyond ourselves. We continue to have a mission beyond ourselves. Can you imagine if those 12 disciples had said, you know what? I really, I, really, I really like it here with just us 12. I know everybody really well. We don't have to be sent out. Let's just keep our group together and no more. If they had said that, if that had happened, guess what? We wouldn't be here today. Amen? We wouldn't be here today. We're here today because the church was sent. The family had a mission beyond itself. So if it says in the text in verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. If you want to circle that word added there real quick. Wow. Because, because that's, that's our prayer, church. That's our prayer as a, as a church. God would keep adding numbers to us. Those who are being saved and those whose lives are being changed. And when, when I'm with family... I understand that I'm enjoying years of just layered sacrifice that my parents had had or grandparents and, and things. And, and, you know, even this past week and, and seeing the, the addition of, of our new little granddaughter, it, it's just amazing. In church here at Believer's Church, our prayer is that God would keep adding to, to our family, would keep adding to that number being saved. And guess whose job that is? It's God's. Some of you are going... Well, I thought you were going to say me. You know what our job is? You ready? Our job is to be the kind of family as a church that he can keep adding to. And that means loving people, accepting people, sharing the gospel, sharing grace, sharing truth, all of those things. 
but being those kind of people. That we would be so accepting and loving and real with one another and with sharing the truth and love and having this mission beyond ourselves. And if we will be this kind of family, then God can continue to add to those who will be saved. Now, I've got two questions on the way out the door, okay? You ready? Here they are, real quick. These are for, for all of us. Number one is this. Guys, come on up. We've got another song, and we're going to be gone. You can put your Bible away if you want to. I want you to listen real close. Is there a need of someone in our church that you're aware of that God is prompting you to help meet? Is there a need of someone in our church that you are aware of that God is prompting you to help meet? The second thing is this. second question is this. Is, is there someone that's outside of the family of God that God would want to add and help use you to connect them to his family? Read that again. Is there someone that's outside the family of God that God would want to add and help use you to connect them to his family? Would you pray about that? Would you be sensitive to that? Would you be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit... There's no question that we have the power of God. Do we or don't we? We have the power of God. What are we going to do with it? 